Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I apologize for being just a couple of minutes late uh, getting started today. Um, actually, what, what I was doing was I was communicating with some of my network and um, because uh, somebody reached out to me last night and asked um, for more things that were sort of focused on how we communicate uh, with our clients. And so I'm actually starting, I'm gonna put to, be putting together a uh, panel um, for, the whole, for the whole faculty of law on like, what are the particular challenges of communicating with clients as opposed to communicating with, you know, opposing counsel or judges, right? So, um, so that's what, uh, what I was doing that uh, had me running a little bit late. But um, so watch this space, that'll be coming. Um, so today we're going to be di uh, beginning discussing things other than just sort of the pure tort of negligence, okay? Um, and the first thing that we're gonna be discussing is what in the Caribbean is referred to as occupier's liability. Uh, in some places, you'll see it referred to as premises liability. So it's, uh, which I think in some ways is a clearer uh, label and in other ways is not. And the reasons why I think it's clearer is occupier's liability or premises liability specifically deals with the types of liability that arise from being attached to some sort of piece of property, okay? Um, in general, if the plaintiff's injuries would have occurred regardless of whether the occupier was on the piece of property, um, the occupier's liability approach is not what we're gonna be doing, right? We're gonna be doing the sort of traditional negligence approach. Um, so to that extent, I think that a premise, you know, the, the phrase premises liability can be a little clearer. On the other hand, like the land is not what's liable. The premises are not liable. It's not even necessarily the owner of the premises that are liable. It's the occupier who is liable. And the question of who is the occupier sometimes becomes a very important one. And so I think that, you know, both of these labels, whether we call it occupier's liability, whether we call it premises liability, they emphasize different aspects of what is unique about the, um, about the, this, this class of tort liability, okay? Um, so we're starting with occupier's liability for sort of our, our beyond negligence discussion because the standard of care is actually very similar. It's still a, a reasonable man standard. Um, it's not necessarily a reasonable man to prevent harm, right? What a reasonable man would do to prevent harm. Um, sometimes it's a little more subtle than that, but it's still we're still asking the question of what would a reasonable person do under these circumstances, okay? So um, one of the basic premises, premises, uh, of occupier's liability is that, you know, on property, hazards are necessary, right? Sometimes there are things that we have to do with our property that are not, you know, that are risky. And um, in addition, we don't necessarily have control over everyone who comes onto our property. Sometimes people trespass. Sometimes people come onto the property, but you know, they're, they're there for a particular purpose and it may or may not have anything to do with us or it may or may not be something that we can control. And so rather than engaging in the you know, reasonable man do no harm standard, we say, okay, look, depending on why the person is on your property, the duty that you have to them uh, changes as, as 
the relationship to the occupier becomes closer, okay? And a lot of times, right, occupier's liability cases are entirely about how the court categorizes the plaintiff. So if the defendant and the plaintiff disagree on what category of visitor the plaintiff was, then which side the court comes down to is going to determine who wins the case, almost always. Okay, so what questions do you guys have so far about this sort of like very broad, very beginnings discussion of occupier's liability? Sorry, can you please repeat that last point again? I'm sorry, Kayla, you, I couldn't quite, there was someone else speaking into, in your space and I couldn't understand what you were saying. Um, can you please repeat the last point that you made? Sure, right? So in a lot of these cases, who wins is determined by who, uh, by which category the plaintiff falls into. Okay, so there are multiple categories of visitors, and we're going to talk about those categories in just a minute is why I'm, I'm being abstract about that. Um, there are multiple categories of visitors. The duty of care is different for each category, right, what the defendant owes to the plaintiff. Um, and so if the plaintiff and the defendant disagree on which category the defendant was in, that very frequently determines the outcome, right? Which, which side the, the court agrees with, okay? So does that help, Kayla? Does that make more sense? Yes, please, thank you. Okay. Uh, Rudolph, you were, you were coming off mute. Did you, did you have a question? You're, you're muted, Rudolph. So if, if you've, if, if you've oh, yeah, got a question, thanks. yeah, go ahead. Now, I was just saying that I'm, I'm glad that you started this particular area because it helps you to understand um, the rights of the person that comes on to your property and um, your rights. But it suggests to me, when I was reading a bit of it, that the person that comes on to your property, depending on who he is, may I find himself with more rights than you in some instances. How do you mean? All right. Um, in some of these instances, as you said earlier, when you're looking at the occupier or, or the, the person who owns the premises, mm -hmm. the occupier, as you said, is not necessarily the owner, but whoever occupies. For example, if you, if you I rent your apartment and you don't live there, I become the occupier. And um, any, anything that happens on there, like for example, if your dog bites me, I can sue you and not, and not the owner. Yeah. Because, uh, because well, you're, 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 you're the occupier. Well, you can, you, you, you can sue, but you might lose, right? Because that depends on sort of what the relationship between uh, you as the visitor and the occupier is. Um, and the other thing, right, just in the specific case of, of dog bites, right, and I've, I've said this before, but I can't remember if it was in a tutorial or in a lecture, but in a lot of jurisdictions, there's sort of a one free bite uh, rule where if a dog isn't a, you know, something, a, a known dangerous breed, whatever that means, um, the first time the dog bites somebody, there's no, there's no uh, duty of care because the owner couldn't have known that the dog was dangerous. And so then the second time the dog bites somebody, it's like, well, you knew he did this, right? Um, so, um, but I, I, I guess what I'm confused by, Rudolph, is I'm not sure how, um, how this means that the visitor has more rights than the occupier. Can, for, can you explain for, that for me? For, for example, if I came on your property, and let's say you had an unattended manhole, or, there was, or you dug a, a ditch in your yard, and I, and I walked across there, and I accidentally hurt my foot, 
I, I can sue you, can't I? Well, I mean, I think it depends on how you arrived, right? And I think that's actually a really useful opportunity for us to talk about the categories of visitor, right? And, and the different duties that are owed to each one. Um, the first thing that I want to note on this is that um, almost everywhere in the Caribbean, the common law governs how we categorize visitors for the purposes of occupier's liability. However, in Barbados and Jamaica, the categorization of visitors has been altered by statute. Okay, so we're going to talk about what the, stat the, the statutes in these two jurisdictions are essentially identical. We're going to talk about what those statutes do with the categorization of visitors, um, but we're going to start with the common law. Okay. At the common law, there are four different categories of visitors. And they sort of proceed, I, I organize them in my mind in order of uh, increasing duty, okay? Um, but there are other ways to organize them. And as, as long as you uh, know all four of them and know the duty of care that is owed to each one, I am not going to care how you organize your thinking about, uh, about these categories, okay? So the lowest duty of care is owed to trespassers, okay? And essentially no duty is owed to them. Um, you, you, can't, you can't engage in intentional torts, you can't behave recklessly toward a trespasser. And so like you see cases involving um, uh, property owners who set up bear traps on their property and they catch a trespasser in the bear trap, well, they are still liable to the, the trespasser because uh, that's reckless. Um, and if you did it um, hoping to catch a trespasser, it's intentional. Um, so, you know, but like in the example that you gave Rudolph, you know, there's an unattended manhole cover on my property and you trespass onto my property and you trip and fall in the unattended manhole, you get nothing because you shouldn't have been on my property to begin with, right? Um, there is uh, the, the, um, the House of Lords did impose a small, very small duty on an occupier toward trespassers. And it's, if you actually know that the trespasser is present, then there is a duty of what they call common humanity. And in these cases, the court asks, okay, would you do something just because like this is the humane thing to do? Okay, um, what, what I, the way I usually like to describe the duty of common humanity is if you are walking along your property and you find an injured trespasser, you probably shouldn't stand there and watch them die. Um, that's probably a breach of the duty of common humanity. Anything else, probably no duty is owed. Okay. Um, so these are trespassers right? No duty except the duty of common humanity, which is so minimal as to, as to be almost non-existent, okay? Suppose and also, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rudolph. Suppose it was a child. Let's say a child is 15 years old. Okay, so we are actually going to talk about children on Monday because children do change things a little bit, um, but that's, that's a really great question. Um, we're going to, and, and it is absolutely something that we're going to talk about, but we're going to talk about it Monday. Okay. Right. Right now we're just getting sort of the, the main thrust of the doctrine, and then we will fill in the edge cases on Monday. Okay. Um, so the next category of, um, of 
visitor is what's called a licensee. And this is just someone who has permission to enter onto land. I want you guys to take note of this category of visitor um, because in real prop one, whether I'm teaching it again next year or whether someone else is teaching it, you will at one at some point talk about licenses. And you should think back when you do that, you should think back to this class and go, oh, a licensee is someone who holds a license, right? It's permission to enter onto the occupier's premises. Um, Uh, so let me, let me pause the discussion of licensee because there's a question in the a private message question. If a person trespasses and injures themselves in a bear trap, the owner of the property is liable to the trespasser. I would say, yes, I have said, I have absolutely seen cases where the court said, yes, that is, that is the case because the, you know, laying a bear trap, laying some sort of trap for the unwary um, is a reckless act, okay? It's at least reckless. It may even be intentional. And so that would violate the very minimal duty that is owed to the trespasser, okay? Um, uh, Colette, you, you were off mute a minute ago. Did you have a question? I was um, asking the licensee is like, for us, um, the persons who come to read your meter, like the persons from the JPS or the yep. Water Commission? Yep. Okay. That's, that's absolutely correct. And in fact, um, one of the examples that I use when I teach licenses in real property is that the Postal Service has a license to come onto your property to deliver the mail. Yes. They, right. That, yeah. Um, uh, a, a, another private question about the bear trap. You guys are really excited about bear traps. This makes me nervous. Don't ever invite me over to your house. Um, suppose you actually lay it for a bear. Uh, it's still reckless, right? You should have known that this was something that could happen and, and you didn't care, right? And so that's the standard for reckless, for recklessness is that you knew and you didn't care, okay? Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's why, you know, things like bear traps or um, the, other, the other case that, uh, that, we, that I read when I was being taught uh, premises liability was You know, I see a sound. It's frozen on my side. I'm, I'm, I'm back. Oh, good, good. <laughs> my, my, my connection dropped. Um, I thought the bear had you, man. I, you know, not, a, not an unreasonable, <laughs> not an unreasonable guest. Okay. Uh, so I apologize for that. Let me, um, all right, so a couple of questions in the chat just to, to go through. Um, and if I, if, if I go through what's in the chat and didn't get your message, um, just pop it in the chat again and, and I'll cover it. Uh, so uh, private question, even if you warned them prior. Okay, so um, warnings to trespassers present an interesting conundrum, right? Um, In general, the duty, the duty to refrain from reckless and intentional acts is not obviated by a warning. Um, that's a statement that includes some $10 words. So let me kind of break it down a little bit, a little bit simpler for you guys. Basically, like posting no trespassing or posting signs warning of hazards, um, does not, or of traps, does not let you off the hook if you shouldn't have been putting traps down anyway, right? You don't, 
don't put bear traps down. Like that's not, that's not how we do things in, in the year of our Lord, 2021. Um, uh, Kayla, I see your hand, leave it up while I, while I go through the rest of the chat. What if the property is properly fenced and signs are put up? I think that's the same answer, right? It's still, you can't be reckless. You can't be intentional. Um, and, and same for the person asking about beware of dog. Um, beware of dog is, is a little more complicated. I think that raises an issue of, um, uh, you know, then there, you're dealing with the issue of the, the one bite and do you have to have control of the dog, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another question, what if you live in a forested area and there are animals around? Um, again, right, it's, it's a question of, are you being reckless, right? Um, and maybe, maybe these become like sort of fact-bound fact -bound questions where the court is, is sort of determining, is this a thing that, that people do? Um, Keandre asked, what's the purpose of buying trespass signs then? Well, what's the purpose of having someone sign an unenforceable waiver of risk? So, um, question, sir. Yeah, uh, one one last thing in the in the chat, and then let me, and then I'll I'll call on Kayla, and then then you, Rudolph. Uh, I'm not understanding the difference between laying a bear trap for a trespasser and shooting a trespasser. There is none. Neither one is both both will lead to liability uh, under under the common law. Um. So. Okay, um, yeah, we don't, we don't allow people to engage in self-help, right? If someone's trespassing, you call the police. You don't, you don't shoot them. Um, so, uh, all right, Kayla, uh, you had your hand raised. Um, what was your question? Um, sorry, you already answered it. Okay, uh, Rudolph, what was your question? I, um, if you are, a, let's say you are a vendor, like um, some you, you you have land and I um, rent it to sell snacks um, and a, and a tent or and a wagon. That that's a licensee. Um. Okay. So, not quite. Okay. Very close. Okay. Okay. The licensee is someone who has no uh no legal interest in the property and no business interest in visiting the occupier okay, okay. okay. and we're gonna we're gonna get to the the situation that you're talking about in just a minute um okay. so like your dinner guests are licensees um the uh um the folks who, you know, the neighborhood kids who come and play in your yard are licensees, at least to the extent that you're not like me waving your cane, yelling, get off my lawn. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, the, the postman is absolutely a licensee, right? They're, they're not there to engage in business with you. They're there to serve a, a particular uh, gratuitous purpose, okay? Question uh, from, from the chat, a private question. What if you own a zoo and the trespasser was eaten by a wild animal? Will you still be liable? I mean, I think that depends again, right? Uh, is it reckless or, in, you know, is it, is it reckless to have wild animals on your property, right? Um, so, uh, Another private question, what if the community is known for robbery, burglary, et cetera, and this specific night someone trespasses and you shot them? I mean, you're still, you, you've still, um, you've still engaged in an intentional tort, okay? Now, is the court likely to award a lot of damages? Maybe not, right? Because maybe there's, an intervening 
a, a superseding or an intervening cause that absolves you of responsibility, right? Um, uh, Derek, that is that is uh, that is incorrect. I've I've been saying all afternoon that you can be liable to a trespasser for reckless or intentional acts. Okay, what there is not is a duty of care to a trespasser. Okay. 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 Because you started off saying that there's no. Let me see what I made a note here. Yeah. No duty. If, to the uh right right you're a trespasser no duty yes exactly so um so the uh, saying doesn't work for the trespasser you know yeah right you know um so again right all of these are questions that turn on is the occupier's action so egregious that it that it rises to the level of recklessness Okay, you know, all of all of these different, you know, fact patterns and ideas that you've come up that you guys have come up with, really creative, really interesting. I'm stealing all of them for exam questions. Um, but uh, they all come down to the same thing. Was the occupier reckless? If the answer is yes, then the trespasser can recover. If the answer is no, then there's no the, then there's no duty owed, okay. Um, all right, so I need to move on from trespassers. I I get that that's sort of the interesting one because you're like, oh, no duty. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? There is no duty. So let's move on, right? The duty to licensees is relatively minimal, okay? The duty to licensees, and again, all of these are, are visitors who are adults of reasonable intelligence and understanding, you know, who, who can be communicated with using language. Um, a licensee is owed the duty to warn them of any dangers or traps that the occupier knows about and that are concealed, okay? So your licensees are entitled to be told about your bear traps that you're not gonna put out because that's reckless. But if you did, you gotta tell the licensees about it. Um, and, uh, but things that are open and obvious, there's no duty to warn a licensee about. So for example, the, um, the uh, open and unintended manhole cover, no duty to warn a, a licensee about it because it's sort of, it's obvious, it's right there. Um, maybe at night you need to have it lit, maybe. Eh, that's, that's, getting, that's getting a little, a little fine grained, but maybe. Um, Private question, would you classify a firefighter or a police officer as a licensee? No, you would classify them as an invitee, the next category, okay? An invitee is a person who does not have a contract with the occupier, but who enters the premises for some sort of business purpose, okay? So the firefighter and the police the officer, I'm sorry? What's the distinction between, between the a licensee and, and an invite between a licensee and an invitee? Yeah. The purpose for which they enter. Oh. Okay. The the oh. licensee is there to do something gratuitous or social. Um the the invitee is there to conduct some sort of business, but they don't have a contract. Okay. And and that, that becomes important because people who have a contract are owed a, a different duty that um, we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay. Um, so an invitee enters for a business purpose, but with no agreement with the occupier. So, right, so the firefighter and the police officer is an invitee because they are coming onto the premises to, you know, fight a fire if that's necessary, to investigate a crime. Um, more typically, 
the, the more uh, typical example of an invitee is the occupier has a retail establishment and everybody who comes onto the property to shop, right, is an invitee. They don't have a contract. There's no, there's no agreement that you're going to buy anything, um, but you're there to transact business with the occupier, okay? Uh, Sasha Ann asks, therefore, a postman would be an invitee then. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that's an unreasonable characterization. The reason I put the postman in the licensee category is because specifically in real property, we use that as an example of a license. However, and I say this, and I, I'm going to digress into real property for 30 seconds here. In real property, we do not distinguish between licensees and invitees. Both of them are said to be holding a license, okay? And if that confuses you, put it out of your mind and don't think about it until, until next semester. Um, but uh, that's the answer, okay, is postman can absolutely be an invitee. That makes sense to me, okay? Um, the duty of care to an invitee is to be reasonably aware of unusual dangers and to prevent harm from them. Does this sound, does this sound familiar to you guys? Okay, the duty is to be reasonably aware of unusual dangers and to prevent harm from them. So I see some guys saying that they're that this sounds familiar. What does it sound like? Tia said, uh, uh, um, who says that? Okay. Uh, somebody says supermarkets. Um, yeah. I mean, like we're all, we're all invitees when we go to the supermarket, right? We, we go in, we haven't promised to buy anything, but we're there specifically to, to buy things. Um, and, and, uh, um, so, um, so what does this duty of care sound like to you guys? Right, right. Shasya says it sounds similar to negligence and that's exactly right. Okay. Um, so if you've ever heard of like, slip and fall cases, if you've ever heard of that as a category of case, these are almost always occupier liability cases involving, you know, wet or slippery floors um, in that the occupier was in some way negligent in how they dealt with the floor. Either they should have known that it was, that it was wet and slippery and posted a wet floor sign. Um, uh, like Latimer, can you explain that, Erica? I don't, I don't, I don't follow that reference. So that was a case where, where the um, flat factory was flooded and one of the workers slipped and fell. Um, yeah. Mm. If it was a worker, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, but look, if you go poking around um, in in the case law in almost any jurisdiction, look, you know, if you look in the in the um, torts area for long enough, and it won't take you very long, you will find a a case where um, you know a store had a spill on the floor, and the plaintiff. Uh, slipped and fell and, you know, broke their hip or their leg or, God forbid, their neck. Um, 
and they're alleging that the store knew about the spill and didn't clean it up, didn't uh, put up a wet floor sign, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the Latimer case, as you've described it to me, okay, this involves what's called a contractual visitor, a contractual visitor. And the reason that we, we distinguish between these guys is these contractual visitors are not owed a duty of care. They are owed a warranty. What's the difference between a duty of care and a warranty? No, you're right, Chelsea, that these are, these are specifically people whose rights arise under some sort of contract. But, um, but there's a specific difference in terms of what a plaintiff has to prove when a defendant is under a duty of care as opposed to when they are under a warranty. Um, that it took the necessary precautions. Right. That's, that's, uh, that's basically it. Let me expand on it just a little bit. Under a duty of care, there is not necessarily an affirmative duty to act, right? You have to demonstrate that what the defendant did was a breach of the duty of care. With a warranty, there is an affirmative duty to take action. Okay? And what is that, that warranty, the affirmative duty to take action, um, is a little bit different depending on the type of contract that you have. Okay. I have a private question. The contract dictates why the duty of care is. So the existence of the contract is why the duty of care is replaced with a warranty. Because this is someone whom the occupier has agreed to allow onto the premises specifically. There's a relationship with them. It's not just that, you know, like with invitees, we've thrown the doors open and anybody can come in and we don't have control over it. The occupier has control over their contractual agents and, and their contractual visitors. They can choose not to enter into contracts. And so by choosing to do so, they have warranted the, the necessary uh, standard of care, okay? Rudolph says employer's liability. It's not just employers, right? So employers are an important piece of this, but it's not just employers who have contractual visitors because what are hotel guests? A, 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 a guest at a hotel has a contract to be on the property, but they are not an employee, right? What are university students? You have an agreement that grants you access to the, to the university someday, God willing, <laughs> uh, but you are not an employee of the university. Unless you are, but that's a different you, that's a that's a different relationship. Okay, being a student does not create the employment relationship. So, if you have contracted to enter the premises, all right. So, if the performance of the contract requires your entry, if you can't do what you've contracted to do without entering onto the premise. The warranty that you are owed is a warranty of a reasonably safe premise, okay? James, I'm, I'm, not, sure, uh, I'm not sure who, who that's directed at, but uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you are... Uh, I have a, a private question asking about planes. And yeah, I think that, that probably aircraft passengers are owed a warranty of reasonably safe 
premises. Now, for those who have, have an agreement for you know, goods and services that afford you a right of entry. So like if you have, if you've called in a takeaway order at a restaurant, you have an agreement to receive goods and services, okay? But you don't really have to go into the premises. You know, you could do curbside, you could do delivery. Eh. But you have a right to go onto the premises and pick up your food. Um, uh, those folks are owed a slightly different warranty. They are owed a warranty of reasonable care that the premises are safe. Okay, a private question like a plumber. A plumber is absolutely the first category, right? Plumber can't do their job if they can't enter the premises. And so they are owed a warranty of reasonably safe premises. Um, however, right, the, um, the pest control guy, okay, maybe, right, we can think of a way that the pest control guy could do their job, um, you know, sort of from the street. You know, is it workable? Probably not, but it's not impossible. Um, you know, particularly in the 21st century, like delivering pesticides via drone or, you know, um, turning loose the aphids to deal with, um, you know, ladybugs, right? Whatever, whatever you, uh, or I'm sorry, put, turning loose ladybugs to deal with aphids. I got that backwards. Um, uh, you know, those are things that maybe you don't have to do standing on the, the occupier's property. Um, so how do you guys feel about the categories of visitors, trespassers, licensees, invitees, and contractual visitors, and the different duties that go with each category? We've, we've covered this sort of at a gallop, and so it's okay if you're a little confused. We're, we're gonna come back to this in a tutorial a little bit later, um, but this is, you know, this is sort of our first cut at this stuff. Go ahead, Colette. What I'll do is um, I'll just read the handout that you send out, and mm -hmm. in conjunction with the tort law book, the Commonwealth Caribbean tort law, Yep, and, I, and you, you guys again. need to be doing that anyway. Yep, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're supposed to be doing that, but I did not. I did not get a chance to look at your handout, and um, then when we meet again, we will. I will be more up to date. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I want to hit just very quickly um, how the statute changes these categories of visitor. And again, uh, for your reference, right, the statute applies in Jamaica and Barbados. The United Kingdom has a similar statute. So if you're, if you're planning on going and practicing in the UK, uh, this will be the framework that applies as well, but certainly in Jamaica and Barbados in, in the Caribbean. Under the statute, Licensees and invitees are treated are, are treated as a single category. Okay, that that category is called visitors. So we have instead of having trespassers, licensees, invitees, and contractual visitors, we have uh, trespassers, visitors, and contractual visitors. Okay, under the statute. All lawful visitors, that's everybody who's not a trespasser, are owed the same duty of care unless they agree to a different one. Okay, so, the, so basically what the statute does is the statute says, if you come on the property unlawfully, no duty, duty of common humanity. Okay, if you come on the property lawfully, 
you can agree to a greater or lesser duty of care. But absent an agreement, we are going to impose a uniform sort of floor for all lawful visitors. And that, that floor is the occupier must take reasonable care to make the premises safe. Okay. All right. So that's, that's the statute. Okay. It creates a minimal standard of care that can be varied by agreement and applies to all lawful visitors. And that, that standard applies in Jamaica and Barbados. Okay. Last thing that we're going to cover today is who is an occupier. And the rule for this is very simple to state, very complicated to apply. The rule is that an occupier is the person who exercises control over the premises. The person who exercises control over the premises. And so we have a presumption, right? If we have no information about anything else, the legal title owner is considered to be the occupier. However, the facts control, okay? We, that, that rule, that default rule, excuse me, does not, um, is very easy to overcome. And we have any number of cases that we can point you to. There's some in the worksheet, there's some in the book. It's not a problem. Um, any number of cases where someone other than the property owner is seen as the occupier. And Rudolph mentioned this uh, earlier today, uh, and I, I sort of ignored it a little bit uh, because I wanted to, to get to it sort of in turn. Um, if the owner has given up control over the property to a tenant, not to their own agent, not to a manager, not to someone that they control, but they have, they've said, okay, tenant, you now are responsible for this property and I, you know, all I do is collect my rent, then the tenant is certainly the occupier, the owner is not, okay? Um, retail vendors almost always going to fall under this rule um, because they, they very frequently don't own the property that their shops sit on, um, but they exercise control over it, okay? What about the street vendors? I don't mean the guys like at the roundabout selling fruit and juice. I mean, the folks who set up stalls like over there in, uh, in Warren's. Um, what, uh, what do we think? Are those, are those folks in control of the premises that they are occupying? No, sir. I would say probably not, right? Um, I mean, they're basically like by the side of the road. Um, there's a couple of food vendors like over there uh, back off the highway that may have control, may. Um, so, so the question uh, for, for Erica and for anyone else who was confused, right? There are a number of like fruit vendors and farmers markets that are set up by the highway over in the Warrens neighborhood um, in Barbados, which is a couple of kilometers from camp from from UE's campus, um, and uh, the question was, do we think that those folks are occupiers in the sense that we've been talking about here? And I agree with Rudolph that they're probably not. Okay, like I said, there may be one or two food vendors sort of away from the highway that might be, but for the most part, probably not. Okay, guys, we are out of time. So if, uh, if I have a private question, in St. Lucia, the roadside vendors pay a very small fee, would that make them occupiers? So you guys are free to leave if you need to, but I'm gonna answer this question if, uh, before we, we wrap up. Um, 
I think the question is still, to the person who, who asked this, the question is still, do they have control over the premises? Um, you know, paying a, like a, a permitting fee or a licensing fee to the government doesn't necessarily give them control over, over the premises. Um, if they, you know, if they have the right, you know, if they, their permit gives them the right to occupy a particular uh, parcel of land and to determine who comes in and sort of how it, you know, how that land is treated, maybe. But if it's just a right to set up their table and their tent and sell, you know, sell their wares, I would be, I, I would doubt that. Okay. So, um, all right. Uh, with that, we're going to let you guys go. Um, you guys have did really fantastic. I really appreciate it. Um, and we will continue uh, revising through this week for the midterm. And then on Monday, we will pick back up with uh, more of this occupier's liability. So with that, I'm going to let you go. So take care and bye. <laughs>